I can pinpoint the exact moment that I fell in love with Prey. I had come across a small room. Behind its bullet-resistant windows, I saw supplies that I so desperately wanted, but the strength of the windows made it so that I couldn't smash my way through, and the door was locked. Some of the more straightforward options could have been to hack the door's lock to get it open, but I didn't have sufficient hacking skills. Maybe I could have identified who had the proper keycard to access the room and use that to get in. Instead, I wanted to make use of my newfound ability to transform into nearby objects. I saw a small bank teller slit as an opening in the glass, but no objects in the room were small enough to get through. I ran downstairs and found a roll of tape that looked to be just the right size. I brought it to the window, used my morphing powers to turn myself into the tape, then nudged my way into the opening and claimed my much needed supplies. Little moments like that were peppered throughout my entire playthrough and are representative of what I think is Prey's strongest quality. It's striking adherence to enabling you to play your way. It's a little ironic that I opened up my review of this game's predecessor, 2006's Prey, talking about development hell. It's a fate that the game was able to escape, but its direct sequel, Prey 2, wasn't so lucky. Originally announced in 2006, a few months after the release of Prey 1 by the publisher 3D Realms, development was to be handled by the same company, Human Head Studios. But the rights of the series changed hands from 3D Realms to Bethesda's parent company ZeniMax in 2009. Development under Human Head continued over the years, but Bethesda cancelled the game in 2014 due to development not meeting their expectations. The early footage shows that it played with the predator-prey dichotomy implied with the series' name by turning you into a bounty hunter who collects bounties on dangerous aliens in an open world. It's sad that we never got the finished product to determine for ourselves if it was anything special, especially considering that its 2011 E3 presentation and playable demo were positively received. Though I will always wonder what that game could have been, what softens the blow is that the game we got instead is magnificent. 2017's Prey was developed by Arcane Studios, the company made famous by Dishonored. And oh my god, it's so good. It's been weeks since my last review because this game has had me hooked. I had to rip myself away halfway through a second playthrough, otherwise I may not have ever gotten out of the rabbit hole. The game's addictiveness and what makes it so strong on subsequent playthroughs is its genre. The immersive sim is what we call these things. When I first heard the word a few years back, I just thought it was a turbo nerdy PC gamer term to sound pretentious, but the term certainly has its merits. It's a genre with a few key attributes that Prey demonstrates in spades. Prey may be a game where you shoot people in first person, but it's not really a first person shooter. It and other games that share its genre like Deus Ex and System Shock all have heavily interactive items and systems and worlds. Rather than developers building out scenarios and scripted sequences, they give you the tools to enable your own adventure and play your own way, and Prey executes that concept wonderfully. You play as amnesiac Dr. Morgan Yu, a scientist trapped on a derelict space station Talos-1. Your end goal is to find a way to deal with the threat of the Typhon, the wispy alien creatures that have taken over the station, and find out what happened to cause the station to go defunct in the first place. There are tons of twists and turns along the way that I refuse to spoil here, but one of the game's best twists is one that will grab you within an hour or so of it opening up. One of the primary goals of this station was to produce neuromods, enhancements that can be injected into humans that could give them abilities they could never have imagined. These neuromods are not only an important part of the world's theme, but also an active gameplay element. They can be used to upgrade Morgan's abilities in diverse ways. There are some traditional enhancements, such as increasing your ability to sneak up on foes or fire guns, but Prey's most fun abilities are the ones that help you interface with the world around you. The ability to hack through doors, pick up heavy items, and of course the aforementioned ability to turn into nearby objects. These enhancements will greatly change the way you interact with the giant labyrinth that is Talos 1 with all of its branching paths and ventilation shafts. And make no mistake, Talos 1 and its super tight level design are really the star of the show here. There's always multiple ways to approach any given room or traverse any part of the station. 
I'd love to give examples, but frankly, experimenting with and uncovering the different ways you can use the game's tools is a good chunk of the fun, and I don't want to rob you of all the little aha moments you're going to feel while playing. Part of me wants to say that there are plenty of ways to sequence break, but with how open the level design is, it's hard to know if there was even an intended sequence in the first place, and I mean that in the best way possible. The sequence is whatever you decide it will be. Perhaps what's most surprising is how real and lived in this space station feels, considering that almost all of its crew is dead. Every corpse that you come across on the station has some sort of story to tell. Before they were a carcass, they were a person with a family and a name. A name that can be looked up within the company directory and perhaps knowing their former occupation will help you scavenge for supplies. Or maybe it won't. Maybe you'll just learn a little bit about this universe or a bit more about this person and the Dungeons and Dragons character sheet they had ready for the game they wanted to play before disaster struck. The whole game is a slow and sobering experience, one that seriously rewards patience and soaking in as much of this universe as you possibly can. Even the simplest of object you come across can tell a story based on its placement. And if it doesn't, at least you can take it with you and feed it into the game's simple crafting system. The game's slow pace and the way it encourages you to interact with every object makes it the perfect candidate for the survival horror elements it slowly introduces. Things are tense enough to begin with. You're low on supplies, health and armor can be tough to come by, and you're all alone. Until you're not alone. The mimics are Prey's most brilliant enemy type. They are aliens that turn into any nearby object, and if you walk by them or turn your back to them, they will shapeshift back into their natural form and pounce. Having these enemies in any other game may not have been all that special, but they really shine here because of Prey's levels and all the other systems. For the purposes of learning more about the world and crafting, you are strongly encouraged to slowly navigate each room and interact with every single object that you come across. And juxtaposing that next to the fact that every single object you come across might just be an enemy in disguise will make you paranoid throughout the entire game. Before I began refining my techniques, I would enter a room and nervously hit suspicious objects with my wrench. And the fact that the game made me as paranoid as the main character is pretty incredible. It's a shame that some of Prey's late game enemies don't carry quite the same punch. The originally terrifying Nightmare Typhon wasn't all that nightmarish once I realized that he could easily be cheesed just by standing in one location for about two minutes before he leaves. Rounding out the package is Prey's combat, which feels really good. The gunplay alone may not be anything special this day and age, but the way that you can use all of your abilities in tandem with the environment is what makes experimenting with the combat so cool. The standout weapon here is the glue gun, which fires sticky glue that can slow down or outright freeze your enemies if you spray them with enough of it. If I suspected that an object up ahead was a mimic, I would preemptively spray the object with the glue gun to force it to stay in its transformed state then whack it real hard with my wrench for a single but decisive strike. That's what's so cool about the glue gun. By itself, it's not a lethal tool and instead must be used in combination with other abilities or weapons. Sometimes when I was fighting airborne enemies, I would use the glue to clip their wings and their rapid descent down to the floor is what would really kill them. And that's just so dang cool. You can also use the glue to create makeshift platforms and reach heights otherwise unattainable. Combat also takes a twist with some areas of the station, particularly the outside, being in zero gravity. The disorienting nature of fighting in truly three dimensions is exciting, and these zero-g sections are some of the most atmospheric exploration moments that I had. The corpses of fallen crewmates drifting lifelessly in space, and the different explanations you could infer as to how they got there in the first place, it's all really chilling stuff. When I think back on Prey, I think back on all the hours I spent exhausting every little part of the space station, and all the ways I got creative when attempting to explore. Some of my fondest moments were the ones where I implemented some sort of clever solution to a problem that was posed to me, and I just felt like an absolute genius. But of course, I'm not the genius. The real geniuses are the ones who crafted this awesome world and these awesome systems that made those experiences possible in the first place. <laughs>